the Czech Republic is a beautiful place. It's a place of ten and a half million people. We reside in the city of Prague, a city of 1.2 million people. It is one of the most beautiful places you will ever visit. You walk into downtown Prague, it feels like you've walked 1,000 years back into human history. Prague was never bombed during World War II. We were so nice as the Allied powers that we just signed it over to Hitler <laughs> to try to appease him. And then he continued extending, and by the time we got over there and began to fight, he actually surrendered before we reached Prague again, so it was never embroiled in the fighting. It was always it actually became the Nazi headquarters during World War II. So when you walk into the city, you're walking on cobblestone streets. Every building is ancient. You walk into Newtown Square, and that's where the headquarters of Hitler was. And they call it Newtown Square because it's newer than Old Town Square. That's deep, isn't it? <laughs> Newtown Square is from the 1500s because that's new. Old Town Square is from the 1200s. That's old. <laughs> okay. The church where we met for the first 15 years that we were there, the building that we were in was built in 1509. <laughs> it's an ancient city. When you walk into Old Town Square, it feels like you've walked on to, into Disneyland, except it's all real. <laughs> it's not facades. Phenomenal beauty. There are more castles per square mile in the Czech Republic than any country in the world. Everywhere you look, it's castles and cathedrals and cobblestone streets, and it's absolutely gorgeous. But though it's a place of great architectural and natural beauty, it's a place of great spiritual darkness. And that nation of ten and a half million people, the city of Prague, 1.2 million people, we currently have one apostolic church. We currently have one licensed apostolic preacher to reach that entire nation. We have a big job in front of us. To make things a little bit more of a challenge, because Brother Johnson, that's not enough of a challenge, I guess. Some of the most recent statistics tell us that 82% of the men in the city of Prague claim atheism as their religion. So four out of the five people that you run into on the street don't even believe that God exists. I was just talking to a university student who is doing a study on worldwide religions, and they informed me that within the last two years... The Czech Republic has surpassed Sweden as the most secular nation in the world. We have a big job in front of us. But thankfully, we serve a great big God. Amen. The Czech Republic is right in the middle of Europe. And the way that I figure, that's a great place for revival to break out. Amen. Amen. I'm expecting there to be a great revival there. The challenge is how do you go into a country that is the most secular country in the world, that is predominantly atheist, how do you preach the gospel in that place? The only thing I know to do is to go in and declare, there is a God. And if you will let him, God can and will change your life. I still believe that God changes people's lives. I still believe that God is able to do above and beyond anything that we could think is possible. Amen. We can't go in there alone. We need your prayers. It's only through prayer that we're going to break into that stronghold of the enemy. But I believe that prayer still works. And I believe that we are going to see a mighty church arise there. In the Bible it says, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I believe all flesh includes Eastern Europe, former communist countries that have been indoctrinated with a, with a philosophy that says there is no God. I believe that God is still going to have a church in that place. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I've got a table set up there in the back. Got some pictures that my wife took in Prague. Take a look at those on your way out. And uh, you can see what we're dealing with, and you can see I'm not lying when I say it's beautiful. Amen. It's a beautiful place. Also on that table, my family is not with me. That's somewhat of a self-preservation tactic. Because when I informed my in-laws that I was taking the grandkids to the other side of the world, 
Those of you who are grandparents understand. My in-law said, we've got to have the grandkids sometime. So we went there for Thanksgiving, and I, my wife and kids stayed until Christmas. So they're with my in-laws so that I can remain alive. <laughs> but I have pictures of them out there on that table so you know that they do exist. <laughs> I have Grant, who is four, and Pierce is one. And then also... There's a picture of my wife there, and I'm not allowed to give her age. <laughs> but I let you know that they're out there because I want you to look at them because I married up. And my wife is very beautiful, and it makes me look good when you see how beautiful she is. <laughs> Amen. It's okay to smile and have fun in church. We should be the happiest people in the face of this earth. Amen. But if you can't have fun in church, where can you have fun? Amen. So take a look at that afterwards and and, uh, and hopefully, that, you know, you can get some of those mental pictures so that way when you get down and pray, you can pray for us. Pray that the Lord would break through those strongholds. Amen. Amen. If you'd like to help sponsor getting us there, I have forms. Talk to your pastor and uh, go through him, and we'll, we're going to get there. I believe the need is great, but I also believe God is greater. Amen. Amen. Well, we're at church, and so when I come to church, I just expect to, to hear from the Word. Now, you're in an unenviable position because you don't know me. So you don't know what to expect. <laughs> you don't know if I'm long-winded or short-winded. <laughs> I got a lot there. <laughs> I like to make a deal with churches. Um, when I preach, I was at a crusade once overseas and got up. And we had a guest speaker from North America. He was getting ready to preach. And before he preached, he was just kind of talking. You know how preachers do sometimes. <laughs> and somewhere in the talking before he got to preaching, he said something along the lines of, if anybody needs the Holy Ghost tonight, all you have to do is come to the front. And God can fill you with the Holy Ghost. Well, the people in the church just believed him. <laughs> so they stood up and started coming to the front. Well, he didn't know what to do because he hadn't preached yet. <laughs> so he looked at his translator. What do I do? Translator basically said, well, it's your fault. You told them they could get the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he didn't know what else to do, so he just put down his microphone and went and started praying with people. And wouldn't you know what? People started getting the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so I'll make a deal with you tonight. I'll preach until I'm done or until you decide you've heard enough. If you decide you're ready to receive something from God, I don't mind stopping. If you're ready to respond to the word, I've decided there's nothing that I have to say that's so important that I would want to stop a move of God. And I don't mind making that deal with you because when I read in the book of Acts, that happened. The Bible says, and while he yet spake, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And if we're a book of Acts church, I don't mind operating how they operated in the book of Acts. And so if you're ready to receive something from God, don't let me stop you. Matter of fact, I'll just join in with you and we'll let God do something great in this place tonight. Amen? Amen. If you would stand with me and turn in your Bibles to the book of Exodus chapter number 3. I'm just going to read a few verses here and then we're going to get into the word. Exodus chapter number 3, beginning at verse number 19, it says this. It says, And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house. 
jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. And I want to preach from the end of that 21st verse. The end of the 21st verse says this, that when you go, you shall not go empty. And I want to preach for a little while tonight on this thought, don't leave empty. Don't leave empty. Amen. Before you're seated, would you just smile at somebody? You look better when you smile. Amen. (laughs) Amen. And God bless you. You may be seated. Now, to kind of catch us up to date as to what's going on here in Exodus chapter number 3, the children of Israel have been in Egyptian bondage for right around 400 years. And no matter how you cut it, 400 years is a long time. And God spoke to Moses and he said, Moses, I've chosen you. You're going to lead my people out of the land of Egypt. He said, but before you take them out of the land of Egypt, there's something I want them to know. I want them to know that before they leave, I want them to go get everything that they can that's a value from the Egyptians. Get their gold, get their silver, get their treasure. Get all of that stuff and take it with you out of the land of Egypt. So Moses goes down to Egypt and begins to share this with the children of Israel. He tells them, God has chosen me and and we're going to get out of this place. Now at that point, I'm sure a lot of the children of Israel stop listening. They hear we're getting out of here. They think to themselves, let's go. Moses goes on to say, Go get all this stuff from the Egyptians. Take all their treasure and everything. The children of Israel are probably thinking to themselves, Egypt can keep all of its stuff. A matter of fact, Egypt can even keep my stuff if they want it. As long as we get out of here, that's all I'm concerned about. (laughs) Right? But God was very specific in what he said. He said, you need to go get all of that stuff. Now, why would God tell them that? Well, I've been living on the road in the minivan that's parked right out there for about six months. And you know what I've discovered since I've been living on the road? It's expensive. (laughs) In the last six months, I've put over 35,000 miles on my van. That's a lot of driving. That's a whole lot of tanks of gas. I get an oil change about every two to three weeks. That adds up. Matter of fact, I just went last week and bought a new set of tires already. I've had a vehicle six months and already had to get a new set of tires. That stuff all adds up. I've got a, my my family usually travels with me. And if you've got kids, you probably understand this. I, I've discovered that children at the ages of one and four are always hungry. <laughs> And this may come as a shock to you, but our minivan does not have a kitchen in it. So whenever they're hungry, which is all the time, guess what we get to do? Go out to eat. (laughs) We usually try to find a place that has a playground to stop and eat, so that way they can burn energy (laughs) before we get back in the vehicle. And all that stuff, it adds up. And... I'm not complaining. God takes care of us. That's not the point. The point is, I have recognized how expensive it is to live on the road. And most Bible historians estimate that there were upwards of 3 million children of Israel that left the land of Egypt. I know the resources our family goes through living on the road. Can you imagine 3 million children of Israel? That's a whole lot of Big Macs. When we run out of stuff, we just stop at the next Walmart and restock. How many McDonald's are there in the wilderness? How many Walmarts? Basically what God was saying, the children of Israel, they hear we're getting out of here. They see the promised land. But God recognized between Egypt and the promised land, you've got 40 years of wilderness. 
40 years with 3 million people. That's a whole lot of resources that they're going to go through. And God recognized anything that you need for along the way, you're going to have to take with you out of the land of Egypt. So he gave them the order. He gave them the command. Go and get everything you can from the Egyptians. Notice he left the responsibility on the children of Israel. He said, if you go and ask for it, I will give you favor and you'll get it. But you have to be the one to go and ask. Can you imagine how that conversation would have gone? Mr. Egyptian taskmaster, it's me, your slave. I was wondering, can I have all of your gold and silver and treasure? Moses told me to ask for it probably not a conversation that took place in the normal course of events but god said if you go and ask i will give you favor by extension that means if you don't go ask you're not going to get it and as you study through scripture as you read on through the book of exodus we can be fairly certain that there was a significant percentage of the children of israel that never went and asked you know how i know that They barely got out of Egypt, and they were ready to stone Moses because they ran out of resources. Now, thankfully, God took care of them, but but wouldn't it have been a lot easier if they would have just done what God asked them to do? Now, I was reading through these verses, and I got to verse number 22, and there was something that really bothered me. You ever read scripture and you're bothered by something? (laughs) I got to 22 and I started to read that. And, uh, well, listen to what it says. It says, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor. There was one word that really concerned me there. It was that word borrow. Because to me what it sounded like was being asked to do is, Go borrow all of this stuff and then skip the country with it. (laughs) It doesn't sound much like borrowing to me. Another word jumps into my mind. It's not really borrow. And so that concerned me. And so I began to pray about it and I began to study this out some. And I believe God gave me a little insight I want to share with you. Because I think in order to understand what's taking place in Exodus 3, you really need to jump back into the book of Genesis. In the book of Genesis, you meet a young man by the name of Joseph. And Joseph was a dreamer. He would have these great dreams and God would give him the interpretations. He would go and tell his brothers, I had another dream. Guess what? God showed me that one of these days, I'm going to be so important, you're all going to bow down to me. Isn't that great? His brothers weren't too thrilled with that. Matter of fact, they threw him in a pit and were probably getting ready to kill him. But right before that took place, a slave train came by. They sold him into slavery, so that way he was out of their hair. They didn't have to worry about him anymore, but his blood wasn't on their hands. He ends up in Potiphar's house. While he's in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses him. Because of that, he ends up in an Egyptian prison. When he's in the Egyptian prison, he meets two individuals, a butler and a baker. They both have dreams. God gives Joseph the interpretations, and the dreams come to pass. The the baker is executed. The butler is restored to his position in Pharaoh's house. Forgets about Joseph until Pharaoh has some dreams, and nobody can give Pharaoh the interpretation of the dreams. The butler remembers Joseph. He goes to Pharaoh, and he says, Pharaoh, there was this guy I met in prison. That's always a great way to start a conversation with your boss. <laughs> there was this guy I met in prison, and he could interpret dreams. And, and Pharaoh said, man, I'm so desperate. Go see if you can find this man. They find Joseph, and Joseph gives him the interpretation of the dreams. Shows him that there's going to be seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. Pharaoh is so impressed, he makes Joseph second in command in all of the land of Egypt. God gives Joseph wisdom. They put back stores during the years of famine, when, uh, during the years of plenty. When the famine comes, it, it's a worldwide famine, and his brothers are about to starve to death up in the promised land. They come down to Egypt because they hear that there's grain. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. 
He sells them grain. They go home. They run out of grain again. They come to Egypt the second time. The second time that they're there, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. His brothers are scared to death. They don't know what Joseph is going to do to them. Joseph makes the incredible statement. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Basically, what he's saying is, God orchestrated my life to get me from Canaan land down to Egypt because God saw what was in front of us. And Joseph tells his brothers, he says, this famine is going to continue on for a while, but basically, I've got the hookup here in Egypt. Whatever we want, all I have to do is speak the word and it's ours. So he says, go on back home, get dad, get your families, get your herds, come down here to Egypt and I'm going to set you up. Okay? I don't imagine he set them up in shacks by the side of the road. Matter of fact, we learn that he sets them up in Goshen land and that's a, a, a fertile part of the land of Egypt and in In an agricultural society, that's the best part of town to live in because that's where crops grow, okay? When we leave the book of Genesis, that's where the children of Israel are. They're rich, they're powerful, they've got the world at their fingertips, they're living in the best part of town. That's the children of Israel. We turn the page Exodus 1. For us, it's a simple page turn, but in that simple page turn, 400 years of human history have transpired. When Exodus 1 opens, the children of Israel are now broke, living as slaves, living a subsistence existence, and they're even dependent on the Egyptians just to keep them alive. We don't know what happened in those 400 years except... Exodus 1 says there was a Pharaoh that didn't remember Joseph, but that's all we know. That doesn't tell the whole story. My question was this, what happened? How did they get from where they were at the end of Genesis to where they find themselves at the beginning of the book of Exodus? And the only thing that I can figure is through the process of time, gradually and bit by bit, All of those things they had at the end of Genesis, they either had taken from them, they sold off, they gave away, they traded away, and now all of that stuff that they once had, they no longer have. And this is the thought that God gave me. Could it be in Exodus 3, what God was really telling the children of Israel was, I orchestrated Joseph's life to get him from Canaan land all the way down to Egypt because there were a lot of things in Egypt that I wanted my people to have. And through the process of time, you lost everything that I provided you with. But now before I take you back into the promised land, I want you to go get back all of those things that should have been yours by inheritance. They should have been yours by birthright, but you lost it all. And now I want you to get it back because I want my people to have those things in the promised land. Now that's the background to the message I want to preach. I can give a big background because it's not a super long message. And Here's the message I want to leave with you tonight, and it's this. You do not receive the Holy Ghost in a vacuum. You don't receive the Holy Ghost in a vacuum. What do I mean by that? When God gives you the Holy Ghost, He gives you the Holy Ghost right where you are. Now, this may come as a shock to some of you, but did you know if you get the Holy Ghost tonight, when you wake up in the morning, you're still going to have to go to work? Did you know when the first of the month rolls around, you still have to pay your bills after you get the Holy Ghost? Do you know you still have to deal with a boss that doesn't like you? You still have to deal with kids who are crazy half the time? You still have to deal with neighbors who you're wondering what planet they're from? (laughs) You still have to deal with tests and trials and tribulations and all that. Even after you get the Holy Ghost... 
You know what we call all of that stuff? Life. And so many people look at the infilling of the Holy Ghost as nothing more than their ticket to heaven. But if that's all that the Holy Ghost was, the moment you were filled with the Holy Ghost, you'd be gone. But we're still here. Did you know that when God gives you the Holy Ghost, He gives you the Holy Ghost right in the middle of your life? And when he fills you with his spirit, he recognizes you don't go immediately from the altar right into heaven. You still have this thing, this wilderness to traverse called life between here and the other side. So he says, I see what you have lying in front of you. I see all that you're going to have to deal with. So when I fill you with my spirit, not only am I giving you what you need to make it over there, but I'm going to give you what you need to make it down here too. Have you ever seen somebody filled with the Holy Ghost? How do they act? Got a 10,000 watt smile on their face. They don't need a back door to the church. They can just run through the wall. They're so excited, you almost have to put them in a straight jacket, and it's a good thing. You ask them to describe what they're feeling, and they can't describe it. They're tripping over their words. They got so much joy and happiness, and, and they say, man, I just feel so much power coursing through me. You know why? Because when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, the Bible talks about all the stuff that comes along with the Holy Ghost. It says, after you receive the Holy Ghost, Acts 1-8, you shall receive power. The Bible talks about the joy of the Spirit. The Bible talks about victory and peace and, and, and power and all of this other stuff. That stuff all comes along with the Holy Ghost. You remember experiencing all of that? When you get the Holy Ghost, you get all of that stuff. It just comes with it. Because you need all of that to make it through this life. But then I also have the chance, I get to go to a lot of churches. I typically preach at anywhere from five to ten churches a week. I get to meet a lot of people who have been filled with the Holy Ghost. And I got a question. When I see a lot of these people, I have to ask myself the question, what happened? Where's the joy? Where's the peace? Where's the victory? Where's the power? Where's all of that stuff that they had when they were filled with the Holy Ghost? And the only thing that I can figure is it happened like it happened with Jacob and Esau. See, Esau had something that was of great value. He had the birthright, and that entitled him to everything that was his father's. But there came a point in his life where he valued something else as a greater value than that that was his most precious possession. And he ended up trading away his most valuable possession for something that was only temporary. He traded away his birthright for a bowl of beans. And I wonder how many children of God have come into the house of God and through the process of time, they come into circumstances, they come into situations, and little by little, I'll just trade away a little bit of my joy. I'll just trade away a little bit of my peace. I'll trade away a little bit of my victory and a little bit of my power and a little bit of this and a little bit of that until they come to a point in their walk with God where they're empty of everything that they once had. And they find themselves coming into the house of God empty of all of that that God gave them. And they come in and they're living a subsistence existence in their walk with God. They come into church and they need the pastor to spoon feed them. They hope that the pastor preaches the pain off the walls so they can get just enough to make it through to the next service. And God forbid anything unexpected should happen because they might just not make it. And that's where a lot of people live in their walk with God. It didn't used to be that way. 
but they've traded away so much that that's where they find themselves now. I'm here to tell you tonight, it doesn't have to be that way, and it shouldn't be that way. I'm here to tell you that there's no reason that you need to leave this place tonight empty of the promises of God. But if you come into this place tonight empty of some of those things that you once had, you can find a place of restoration. You can find a place where you can once again be filled with the treasures and the Spirit of God in your life. You don't need to walk out of this place empty, but you can leave full of all of His promises. What are the treasures that you must have? The number one treasure you must have is a relationship with Him. Humanity was created to live in relationship with God. Every day, Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the day with God. But because of sin, that relationship was broken. But because of the cross of Calvary, the avenue was opened up for restored relationship between God and man. How can that relationship be restored? Number one, the Bible says you must repent of your sins. What is repentance? Repentance is saying, God, I'm sorry for everything that I've done that's against you. But with your help, I'm not going to live that way anymore. But I'm going to do my very best to live according to your word. That's what repentance is. And then the Bible says that you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In a theological sense, wherever the name is invoked, His presence is. So when you are baptized, it's important that you be baptized in Jesus' name because then His presence comes and can pay for all of your sins through His blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. If you have never been baptized in Jesus' name, you talk to your pastor or your associate pastor, they would love to baptize you in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins. And then the Bible says you must be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's predominantly what I've been talking about here tonight because it's when you receive the Holy Ghost that you receive all of this other stuff. It's when you receive the Holy Ghost that you receive the joy and the power and the victory and the peace and all of that other stuff that comes along with it. And if you've never received the Holy Ghost, there's no reason that you can't receive the Holy Ghost before you leave this place tonight. A matter of fact, if you want it, I expect you to receive it. Now, I do want to give one word of instruction. If you're kind of new to this, you've probably heard about us Pentecostals. Speaking in tongues and all that sort of stuff. I want to give this little bit of instructions because a lot of people, especially if they're new to this, they come seeking speaking in tongues. And I tell you, if you come doing that, then you're going to be disappointed because you're seeking for the wrong thing. If you would like to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, you come to this front and throw up your hands, begin to worship him and you seek to get all of God that you can. And if you'll get all of God that you can, don't worry, you will speak in tongues. But it's not tongues you're seeking, it's Him. You get Him, don't worry about the other stuff. It'll just come. Okay? But I would venture to say probably the majority of us in here tonight have already been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. You're not off the hook. Because now I'm going to ask you to do something that's really hard to do. I want you to get honest with yourself. And I want you to start to ask yourself some really difficult questions like, am I still living with the same power that I once lived with? Am I still walking in the same victory that I once had? Do I still have the same joy of the Holy Ghost flowing through my life? Do I still have all of that that I had when I was first filled with the Holy Ghost? Or through the process of time, have I lost bit by bit some of those things that I once had? And I know how it is. We sit on the pews or we sit in the chair and we hear the preacher think. And the first thing that goes through our mind is, man, I hope so-and-so on the other side of the church is hearing this. They really need this. 
That's what we do. How do I know? Because I've done that. And you know why we do that? Because it's easier for us to have faith for somebody else to receive something than it is for us to receive what we need. I can have faith for them. But when it comes to my situations, it's a lot harder. And too many times because we have faith for them and not for ourselves, we get up and we walk out of the church doors just as empty as we came in. And there are people who come to service after service after service with real needs, real situations, in desperate need of a touch of God. And they walk out just the exact same way they came in. Not because God's power is lacking. But because just as it was in Exodus chapter number 3, God leaves the responsibility for asking on us. He said, if you go and ask, I will give you favor. And too often, we walk out of the doors of the church without ever having asked. Because we think it's kind of like the children of Israel. That'll never happen. That can't happen for me. Who would even think that would be possible? Oh, they can get what they need, but I don't know that I can get what I need. And isn't it the word of God that says, ye have not because ye? And we walk out devoid of the spiritual blessings of God and the spiritual treasures of his presence simply because we didn't ask. I'm here to tell you that there's no reason for you to walk out of this place empty tonight. Whether you need the Holy Ghost, whether you need joy, whether you need victory or power, whatever it may be that you need in the presence of God, His Spirit is here tonight and there's no reason that you should walk out of this place empty. But if you will get some courage and backbone of the Spirit to say, God, I'm not going to be satisfied to walk out of this place the way that I came in. But God, I'm here in desperate need of the touch of your spirit god i need you to restore some things to my life god i need your spirit to move in and do a work inside of me you know all that it takes for a move of the spirit of god is somebody to respond to his presence that is there We think we need music and we think we need people running the aisles and and swinging from the lights and everything else. Did you know I'm not against any of those things? Matter of fact, I'm in favor of all of that stuff. But often it's a lot of that stuff that's just there to build our faith, to get us in the presence of mind, to respond to him. God doesn't need that stuff. Let me give you an example. I was preaching a crusade overseas. This was an outdoor crusade. I had just preached and I turned it over to another minister. He was doing the altar call. While he was doing the altar call, I was giving instructions to our altar workers. We did altar call unlike any altar call you've probably ever seen. Matter of fact, when I tell you how we did it, you're going to say that doesn't sound very Pentecostal. But what we did is we just got a bunch of chairs and lined them up in the altar area facing the pulpit. And we just told the people, if you need the Holy Ghost, come sit in a chair. We had about 40 or 50 chairs lined up there. All the chairs got filled, and then people started making lines behind the chairs. The minister led them through repentance, explained to them what repentance was, and then he said, I'm going to speak the word of faith. When I speak the word of faith, these altar workers are going to lay hands on you, and you're going to receive the Holy Ghost. Pretty simple. How come we make the things of God so complicated right there? That's the biggest battle that we fight. But really, it's pretty simple. We don't have to complicate things. So he got up and he spoke the word of faith. He said, now by the authority and the power of the word of God, receive ye the Holy Ghost. We began to lay hands on people and instantly people started getting filled with the Holy Ghost. As soon as they would get the Holy Ghost, we would send them to the platform so we could find out where they were from and introduce them to the pastor that pastored closest to them. 
And then somebody else would sit in their chair. We'd pray for them. They'd get the Holy Ghost. We'd send them up to the platform. Well, after I had prayed a couple of people through to the Holy Ghost, I had just preached I was getting tired. There's a reason we call it altar work. It's a lot of work. So I called for reinforcements. I called for somebody. I said, will you come pray with my chair? I said, I'm tired. I'll be back in in just a minute. And it was an outdoor crusade, so they came and prayed my, at my spot. I went and got a bottle of water, and I was standing on the sidewalk overlooking the plaza area where we were having this crusade, and I was sitting there drinking a bottle of water. As I was drinking that bottle of water, a man came by and stopped and started to talk to me. He said, what's going on over there? I said, we just had church, and people are getting the Holy Ghost. Well, my faith was pretty high because I was... Just seen a bunch of people get the Holy Ghost. They were still getting the Holy Ghost. So I asked him, I said, would you like to receive the Holy Ghost? Now, it's not supposed to happen this way. He wasn't there for church. He hadn't heard the altar call. I didn't even take him to the altar. We're standing on the sidewalk in a metropolitan area. Would you like to receive the Holy Ghost? He gave me a really faith-building response. He said, sure, why not? <laughs> That's good enough for me. I explained to him what repentance was, and I said, now just lift your hands and begin to worship God, and God is going to fill you with His Spirit. I laid my hands on him, and in just a few moments, he began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave him utterance. Before we left that day, 256 people had been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost for the very first time. I say all that to say this. Sometimes we put God in the box of how we think he has to work. When we need to remember, he's God. And all it takes is us to respond to Him. And He has all the power that's necessary to do what needs to be done. While I was praying for that man on the sidewalk over there, a friend of mine was praying with a man they brought on a stretcher up on the other side of the altar. Well, my friend leaned down and began to pray for him. and He lifted his hands, began to say, Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My friend got down on his knees and was speaking into his ear, trying to explain to him how to receive the Holy Ghost. Well, after a little while, my friend got really frustrated because the man was not following any of his instructions. <laughs> he said, I wanted that. He said, I was desperate for this man to receive the Holy Ghost. He said, I finally got up and started talking to the people that carried him to the front, saying, does this man not understand English? Because we can get a translator or something. To, and they said, you don't understand what happened. When we brought this man to the front, he had a tumor at the base of his brain. He has been totally paralyzed and has not been able to speak for years. And the moment you laid hands on him, he immediately threw up his hands and began to say, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Sometimes we don't even recognize what God is doing. But if we'll just let God be God, he's going to get the job done. He's going to get the job done. We don't need to worry about it. If we'll just respond to him and say, God, however it is that you want to move, God, whatever it is that you want to do, here I am. I need something from you, God. And however you want to make that happen, that's okay with me, God. And I'm here to tell you, we're about to step into the realm of the supernatural and miraculous. I'm done. I'm not going to give some great altar call or heart-tugging story. I'm not going to do any of that. Because I'm just crazy enough to believe that God is big enough that if there's people that have real needs, if they'll just respond to Him, He'll show up. I'm a pretty simple preacher. So if you would, would you stand with me right now all over this place? I don't know you. I don't know your situation. I don't know your circumstances. And you may be thinking to yourself that your situation is impossible.
I'm here to tell you God is big enough. And if you'll just give him a try, there's no telling what God can do tonight.